Hi, Madonna Louise Veronica Ciccone here. When will you understand that I am a person and not a thing? Look it up. Do something else. Do my eyebrows. Better to say, am I being true to myself? And is this what I want to say? And have I expressed myself the way I want to express myself? I mean, that's what it's all about. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is producer and songwriter Guy Sigsworth. And you're listening to MLBC, the Madonna podcast. Hey, guys, it's Tony. Ven conmigo. Let's take a trip. <laughs> and hey, everyone, it's Stefan. Welcome to another episode of MLVC, the Madonna podcast, your place for all things Madonna Louise Veronica Ciccone. And as you heard today on the show, we welcome legendary music producer and songwriter Guy Sigsworth. Guy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. How is everything, uh, Guy? How are you in? Uh, you're in London. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in London, uh, and it's, uh, it's actually very fine weather, but very breezy, very kind of uh, uh, windy, I'd say. <laughs> And are things sort of getting back to normal or things are opening up and you've got a little bit more freedom? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's, it's not, I don't feel um, I've done too badly out of uh, you know, the current situation compared to, uh, compared to many people. I think I've yeah. had it pretty good, really. Good. Yeah. How about you guys? How's it, how is it in, uh, are you in New York? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, in New York, they're trying to get everybody vaccinated and... Um, mm. It you know it seems to be going okay. I think no. people are starting to go back to work, but you know it's still it's still I, normal. I don't know if that's anything we're going to get back to. I think it's just going to no. be something something new, you know. Mm. But it is plenty crowded in the streets and the subways. Let me yes, tell you, is. like you would right. never know. Things have other than the fact that people are wearing a mask. It right. looks, it's it's business as usual. So, mm. um, but yeah. So let's. Tony, if you, can you give Guy a proper introduction to our audience? Absolutely. I'm going to keep this brief because if I <laughs> went through all your accolades, I would be here all day. So, <laughs> well, Guy okay. Sigsworth is a UK-based multi-instrumentalist, producer, and songwriter who's worked with such amazing artists that we all know and love, including Bjork, Seal, Britney Spears, Alanis Morissette, of course, Madonna, and so, so many others. He was one of the founders of Fru Fru, along with Imogene Heap. They have an amazing... Mm-hmm album that I still listen to called Details. And, and, and Guy also has like this incredible album called Stet that I've been listening to for the oh, last thanks. week. And it's, you know, check it out if you love amazing music and um, instrumentation and just a really good vibe. So yeah, mm. welcome, Guy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've been following your career since I first heard uh, Seal's Killer. So this is such a big moment for me to like get mm. all these questions answered but yeah let's start with mm. your we love an origin story so tell us about growing up in the UK briefly mm. and then studying music abroad in Portugal Netherlands how that kind of shaped your your musical view and you know also playing harpsichord on tour before you returned to London and then found yeah. yourself surrounded by house music <laughs> yeah yeah it doesn't make much sense does it it's all pretty <laughs> random but um I, I grew up in uh, the Yorkshire Dales kind of quite far away uh, from the big city and the bright lights. Uh, and my dad, uh, who was an engineer, he bought pianos he'd found in barns. And so in the house, there was like three pianos in various mm. states of repair. And I think it just meant that I wound up playing a lot of music, just looking at the view of the, of the moors. And it just got me really to just love sort of making music by myself. And, and even though um, I really love the, the bright lights in the big city. Maybe that was the one good side of that was that I'd spend a lot more time getting really good at that, that I wouldn't have mm-hmm. done if there'd been all the distractions <laughs> yeah. of elsewhere. Um, so that, that was kind of good. And then um, I, I went to university to study music and I got re- I was really into, I suppose, always the sort of weird and misfits ends of classical music. So I, I really loved either very avant-garde music or very old music. And particularly, I love the really old stuff because... I suppose there was more freedom to kind of make it up and figure out what was going on. And a lot of the performers were exploring these unusual instruments like harpsichords and all that kind of stuff. So I think there was a kind of spirit of, I don't know, Indiana Jones type adventurer Mm -hmm. in that kind of music, which probably there wasn't in straight conservatoire, you know, playing the regular repertoire, which is, you know, I still love that music, but Mm -hmm. I, I just felt the spirit of adventure was elsewhere. So I wound up uh, going to a lot of these musical summer schools in, in Portugal where they, um, 
they were sort of like, te- this is when I was a teenager and they were like teaching harpsichord and stuff. And it was in this castle and, and I loved that. And um, mm-hmm. then I wound up playing harpsichord for the European Baroque Orchestra, um, which, you know, took me various places. But then when, I, when that was over after a year and I kind of found myself thinking, okay, well, it's time to go to London and try and make a go of things. Um, <laughs> you know, I did, I did a couple of good concerts I got invited on and everything like that. And then I was kind of sat in my room and I started listening to a thing that was really big in the UK at that time, which was pirate radio. Mm-hmm. And it was all these, I don't think in the USA you've had the similar thing, but it would be literally people would just put up an, an aerial on a tower block and play whatever music they liked. Mm-hmm. And it meant you were hearing music that had just been created five minutes ago. And um, it wasn't about, you know, somebody having to make a record and then get a record deal and put it out. Right. They were just making the music as they heard it. And it was, originally there was a, they were playing a lot of them, uh, I suppose, Chicago House and then later Detroit Techno and stuff like that. And later it was also where drum and bass and that whole thing came from, and I just was listening to all this stuff, and uh, I just kind of loved it. And so I, I bought some really basic equipment and started trying to do my mistaken version of it and, and <laughs> was kind of enjoying that. And then um, what happened was I'd, I'd got, like, a cassette um, that I could record onto, um, a four-track, and I'd got, like, a computer making some noises. And, I don't know, a friend of a friend said, oh, there's this guy who's written some songs. Could I record them? And I, I recorded them the best I could just on this and then he took it to a guy who owned a much more expensive studio and the guy didn't like his songs but he said well who who did all the programming and stuff and he invited me to his studio and when I went there I met Seal on the staircase mm-hmm. um, and it was this thing where I could hear Steel, Seal was trying to use um, to, to mix this kind of flavor of this music um, into his own music and you know whoever was the engineer in the room didn't, didn't get it and so I was kind uh-huh. of a bit bold and brave and said um I know what you want to do and I can do it properly and, and come, you know come to me and that sort of stuff so Seal so came round to my place and we immediately wrote um the track that became the beginning the first track on his album and you know later we did uh, crazy and and I became sort of a little bit aware of that scene because I got to know Damsky and I you know I heard Killer even before it was released and just thought that was amazing it's still uh, astonishing to me that record um it's been hit so many times and um mm-hmm. uh I'm still you know uh, in touch with Adam and I, I kind of love what he did and I think he um was actually a liberation to lots of people in the UK because there was this whole scene of dance music that, that had opened up and it was just DJs and Adam suddenly realized if he, if he could plug in all his gear just into the stereo things of the DJ thing, he could play live. And I think you'll find that Prodigy, all those bands, mm-hmm. kind of all goes back to Adamski. And I think uh, Adam deserves to be bigged up, not just for that one amazing song, but for uh-huh. really showing. And I've even heard people like Daft Punk admit that Adamski was like a huge influence in showing mm-hmm. it could be done. And mm-hmm. I, th- I don't know if in the States maybe you only know that one song, but it was the fact that he, he could tour it and play, play DJ night, club, club nights and play live. Yeah. Um, that was a sort of revelation. Um, and I, I love kind of what Adam sort of achieved with that. Uh, anyway, that kind of led to me <laughs> getting involved in Seal's first record, which um, meant that the first record producer I, I got to meet, who was a bona fide record producer, was Trevor Horn. Um, That's amazing. <laughs> which is, of course, amazing because Trevor is probably the most intense record producer ever he's not one of those guys who just you know gets the band and puts the mics up i mean he's not steve albini should we put it that way he's the he's the opposite of that you know (laughs) well and i guess working you know when you find like that you're working on seal's debut album i mean Mm. crazy was huge that was everywhere and um and i assume that that was then good for you right yeah i mean the thing was that um i got to meet a lot of musicians working on it because originally um I was working with Tim Simon and the Bomb the Bass a bit um, mm-hmm. to initially sort of lay down tracks and get some ideas going. And I got to meet some other musicians through him. Uh, like one who uh, I was really good friends with, uh, this guy called Gota Yoshiki. And Gota had been the, he, he was originally a Japanese reggae drummer who'd come to London. I know, oh, it's that's, just, that's just like, that's amazing. But Gota wound up programming on all these Soul to Soul uh, records. And you know, that famous boom, that's really Gota's programming. And um, so I got, you know, Gota got me involved um, in 
working on some Japanese music and then actually as soon as the Trevor record was finished I did this tour of Japan where I discovered in the band was Talvin Singh so I got to meet Talvin mm. and you know so we had a great time playing in Tokyo I was also I was playing second keyboards to the great Bernie Worrell of Parliament Funkadelic and the basic <laughs> gig was whatever he he didn't want to play I played you know it's kind of like <laughs> you know you know listen to all the keyboards on the record what you know what if he wants to play the Moog tonight then you don't play the Moog you play the other stuff if he wants to play the clavinet, then you play the Moog, you know, and it was just, it was a great gig. Mm. And then when I got back from Tokyo with Talvin, where we'd been both sort of bonding on various things that we loved, Talvin sort of phones me up and says, well, um, I'm with Björk and we're trying to form a live band to play a new record. Do you want to come over? <laughs> so I went over to a rehearsal room and it's like Björk and Talvin and then there's me. And, you know, he's playing me the debut album and we're trying to figure out how to play it live which was just like a dream, you know. And um, so it's through Talvin that I got to know Björk, and, and that led to me becoming MD of Björk's band for two, two tours, you know, um, which was Well, I know, Tony, I know Tony had some questions about, about Talvin. Yeah, yeah. Tal- Talvin Singh, I, the, the first time I heard, um, okay, I, mm. I was like, I can't believe I've lived my entire life without hearing this i mean right he he just kind of blew me away i mean in my opinion he's like one of the most brilliant electronic artists like yeah. along with another collaborator of yours david sylvian you know yeah. uh, it you know it just kind of opened my eyes to so many other types of music yeah and um you know obviously working with bjork but um you know he had this famous legendary club night anoka at the blue yeah. note in london did you ever have a chance to attend or was that oh yeah like, yeah I went. Of- yeah there was this amazing time in London, uh, where there's the, the, the Blue Note, mm-hmm. um, and it was also around the time when that little particular area of London was just getting real energy because the the Brit art artists all had their studios near there, and the that one club, like I remember every Sunday night it was Goldie with Metalheads doing drum and bass, and every Monday it was Talvin with an ochre. So you know, I think <laughs> Cold Cut had a night. I think I mean like every night you go there and you'd hear something interesting, but. Anoka was the most interesting because um, you couldn't tell what you'd get uh, beyond the fact that it would vaguely have some kind of connection to people who somehow knew Talvin. But you might get people who were doing some weird Asian meets drum and bass thing, or they might be mm-hmm. doing some other, other flavor. Um, and it was uh, always fascinating, the kind of musical kind of collisions that would happen in that club. I loved it. Um, yeah. and I, and I loved, you know, on Sunday nights, I'd go in there and it was Goldie and he always, he was just, I loved Goldie anyway, we was gotten great. And he treated me like royalty, um, because you know, Goldie had been the Björk band support act in the States on the oh. first American, American tour. So, you know, he'd always, as soon as he saw me walk in the door, you know, he'd get me the bubbly and all this kind of stuff. It was fantastic, <laughs> you know? Um, and I loved this whole drum and bass music because it, it, it just sounded like this most futuristic, accelerated metabolism sci-fi music. And I still think the best drum and bass feels like that now after all these years. It still has this feeling of, you know, it came from a time machine from 2187 or something. You know, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't, you know. <laughs> and I just love being a part of all that. Uh, and one thing I loved about Talvin, um, which is still true today, is um, Talvin is an amazing musician in the moment. And it's like... Funnily enough, Talvin, well, he was just before lockdown, he was doing an anniversary for the, for the OK album, and he asked me to come yeah. along and play live mm. at the um, Fest- World Festival Hall. And, of course, he asked me to play on a track I hadn't played on or worked on on the album, and I'm going, okay, what am I going to do? <laughs> and it's always this way with Talvin. I go to rehearsal room with him, and like after we've played for like about half a minute, I say, let's stop. This is actually going to be great. And I know with you, if we don't rehearse, it'll be brilliant. If we do, it won't be as good because I know what's going to happen. And Tom's always like that. It's like when it's a total state of emergency and you think it's going to collapse, it turns out brilliantly. And then sometimes if you try and capture that and, and bottle it, it doesn't work as well. Yeah. I had a question. So, I mean, you, you obviously you play several you know classical instruments, but then Calvin, right. does he play the tabla and any other of those instruments, when you guys get together to play, how do you decide yeah. which sounds come through? Um, I think um, he, uh, you know, his, his tab- tabla licks are astonishing. I mean, he's really yeah. up there with the greats, you know. Um, and, and so on that level, there's, you know, no, 
no question of his skill set. You know, mm-hmm. he can do anything with those instruments he wants to do. Um, and, you know, he's branched out into electronics and other um, instruments. I think, um, for me, I love hearing him uh, on percussion, but it's just wherever he goes, it's, it's seeing how he does it. And I think what I loved with the um, preparing for this um, show was that he'd figured out ways where we weren't so chained to sequences and stuff. Like, he'd got a, a human beatbox guy to do some of the beats so that um we could all go wherever we wanted to now that, that obviously talent's music isn't you know in song structures where you have to hit the chorus at a certain point mm-hmm. so it can it, it can have that leeway that you you know you wouldn't do that if you were playing um you know a traditional song structure but um you know and before talvin actually had uh you something reminded me before talvin had um the Inoka thing i did a couple of things with him before where he had something he called the talvin sync session Again, he got all these musicians, and we, we're walking on stage, and we've got about enough music prepared to get us through the first ten minutes of the concert. And <laughs> go, what are we going to do after this? And it was amazing. It's one of those things where, you know, some guitar player's foot slips on an effects pedal, and and you somehow, by accident, you make a song out of it. You know, mm-hmm. and, and Talvin is the, the extreme end of being able to do that. Um, and I do love that, and I have actually. I think maybe through the experience of working with Talvin, it's made me more, um, more willing to try that. I mean, I'm, I'm very good at super detailed music where we yeah. kind of fuss over every nanosecond of the music. But I have actually, like, uh, the Björk album, uh, uh, not homogenic, what's the, uh, Vespertine. You know, there are a few yeah. songs there where, mm-hmm. where literally um, the initial material was total improvisation. It was literally we put up the mics, you know, she's reading a Cum- Cummings poem or she's going to sing it or something. Oh, wow. And other other elements are added later, but you kind of honour that first moment of improvisation, and that's like the extreme opposite of that kind of every nanosecond is like fussed over, almost like a like a stop frame animation, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think it's good to try and have it both worlds, to you know the the kind of super detailed and the sort of mm-hmm. super feel it. Yeah, no, and friend. that's that's one of the things I love about um, you know your work with Talvin is that. You just don't know where it's going, but no. it always sounds so good. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. One of the one of one of the standouts from Talvin's work at the time was um, he did a the Vikram remix of "Nothing Really Matters" from Madonna from the Ray of Light album. Would you say yeah. that he was the one to first work with her, and did he provide an introduction, or did you uh, get involved with Madonna's uh, team through another organic way? Um, I, I, funny enough, I rem- I did work on that Vikram remix. You've, um, oh, okay. Yeah, Tell us about I that. Kinda, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was just one of those things where he sort of invited me around, and before I know it, I thought we were just chilling out, and before I know it, I'm playing keyboards on it. It's one of those things, but <laughs> I can't remember it too well, actually. But yeah. there was a bit of um, me saying to him, Tommy, you do realize this is Madonna. You, you better raise your game here. We can't just be, we can't be too chilled out here, and me sort of probably getting, <laughs> trying to get a bit bossy or something, and realizing that that wasn't the way to to what we tell them but um uh i don't think that led directly to my working with madonna that i came about um basically um uh yeah i'd worked for this band mandalay and we'd made this record um that was one of those things you sometimes do where you work really hard on something and it didn't mm-hmm. really take off commercially but oh it took what, off at my house trust me i listened. Well, that's the thing <laughs> I, I would say to people you know the good thing was that at least one of the people who bought it and loved it was madonna <laughs> Yeah. So even if you know it, it, the rest of the planet d- didn't pick it up as much as they should have, you know, it landed in the right hands. It yeah, no, in the I, right place. When I and saw I think, the track, oh no, go, I was yeah. going to say when I saw the track yeah. listing for the next best thing soundtrack, I was like, oh my god, she's been listening to Mandalay too. Yeah, you know. That's, so I mean, yeah, tell us how that came about. Well, I think there's funny things about that because I remember when we when I was working with Saul and Nicola, a lot of people said Nicola's voice sounded like Madonna, and I I didn't. I didn't think too much about that because, you know, that can be a, a sort of curse to be thinking about that when you're trying to make a record, you know, because you don't want to push it to sound more or less like Madonna. You just wanted to be sure, yourself, sure. right? You know? <laughs> um, but um, I, then when Madonna was working with Mark Stent, the uh, mix engineer, Mark just mentioned my name once. And she said, oh, guy. And then she, apparently, then, and then that's when, you know, Spike phoned me up because he said, oh, uh, as soon as he'd mentioned my name, she knew me and it was from all that stuff. Mm. And... Um, that was fantastic. So um, she, I don't know if it was she asked me to send her stuff or what, I can't remember exactly how it all happened now, but I, I had a, 
I just made it like a CD with some track ideas and it had two ideas. And it's one of those things where one was more the cliche idea of what you think you'd write if you're trying to write something for Madonna. And the mm-hmm. other one was what it feels like for a girl, which is always the one I thought she's really going to go for that one, not the other one. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, but, I was going to, I was wondering <laughs> if, if you're, when you got involved with her for what it feels like for a girl, I was going to ask you mm. if there were other songs that you sort of presented her with or when you sent her what it feels like for a girl, was mm. it just lyrics? Was it just music? No. What it consisted of was, um, it was always some things actually. I, I, I don't want to get too nerdy, but I just bought, I'd got a bank loan to buy Pro Tools, you know, the big system. Before that, I'd been using Akai samplers and all this kind of tail end of the um, British dance uh-huh. bit stuff that we used to work with. And then I, later when I met Willie Morbett, I discovered he, uh, he was using exactly the same kind of budget gear that we all used at that time. <laughs> and... Um, Having bought Pro Tools, I was kind of teaching myself how to use it. And actually, the funny thing is, what, the, what it, I'd had an engineer, Damien Taylor, who's sort of my first engineer, who went on to do fantastic things uh, with the Killers and stuff. And Damien was just like getting me, like, uh, to teaching me how to operate it. And then the first day I went into the studio completely on my own to operate it, I wrote the backing track of what it feels like for a girl. I, I created nice. it all myself on the screen, and it was a kind of experiment. Um, and then... Um, the music didn't quite follow the structure of the song because it was just like, you know, a set of sounds and chords and beats and stuff. Um, but I did put in the Charlotte Gainsbourg sample at the front. And that's one of those funny things where I'd just seen this movie um, and it stuck in my mind for that funny reason. that Obviously, Charlotte Gainsbourg's father is, Serge Gainsbourg is very French, but yeah. we often forget that a mother, um, you know, is English. So, of course, mm-hmm. when I saw this movie, I was expecting her to be talking like this in the movie. <laughs> and, of course, she has this perfect English accent. And I don't know why, but it just, I just kept listening to her all the time and just like, loving the sound of her voice a bit. And so I thought, I'm just going to sample something from this film and just put it in. It. And obviously, Madonna loved it, and that, that got her inspired you know, to write the lyrics. Um, and it's one of those things where we talked a bit on the phone, and then the first time we met together and she brought out a piece of paper with the lyrics and everything and she kind of like sung it to me that, you know, I, I kind of kept my cool, but there was a little mini me inside just going, yeah, <laughs> I can't believe it. You know, because I could hear what she'd written. I thought, oh, it's fantastic. Um, and then the big so thing you was, didn't you didn't go to her with an idea about the song. You didn't say, no, here's what it was, I, it was, here's it was what I think the, kind, the lyrics. No, it was just a backing track um, to inspire her. And I assumed that she'd be writing something over it if she liked it. Um, Mm -hmm. I had no idea, really. I I mean, I'd never worked with it before, so I didn't know. Um, But I think what happened then was, yeah, she'd written this top line. And there was just this one funny thing, which is that at a certain point between the verses and the choruses as she'd written them, things kind of went out of sync. And, you know, my thing was, oh, that's easy. We'll just stick an extra bar here and it'll be okay. She was like, Mm -hmm. "No, no, I want you to work it harder so it was this really interesting thing where we kind of decided that we wouldn't add or subtract any sounds from what i'd written but i'd have to kind of create the feeling of a verse and a chorus by just by moving all the blocks on the screen Mm. um so you had to kind of it's it's like a self-imposed imitation um because you know you can only work with the blocks and okay you could cut them up and maybe pitch them up or down but essentially just this kind of cubist blocks of sound Mm-hmm. moving them around. And I think she made the right call for me on that because it meant I had to be creative in a very specific way to make it fit. It's particularly her verses, I think. The, the choruses, yeah. it kind of always flowed that way. Um, and I think that was a great challenge because, um, you know, if you'd just got, gone over to a synth and played a different chord progression or something, it, it would have worked, but it would have it lost this kind of digital edge it had because I think the song... At that time, I mean, like with me, I just bought my Pro Tools, and, and I think there was something in the culture we were doing at that time, which I think was very exciting, where there were lots of people saying, well, there's this new thing of digital and, and, you know, CDs and all that stuff. And what is it in digital that's quirky and unusual and, and spooky and strange and interesting? Hmm. Uh, you know, and whether it's the, the sort of digital clicks of a CD player or the, you know, you know, the sort of scanning sounds and all this kind of stuff. And let's embrace that. I think mm-hmm. um, Mirway's actually got that into his records with Madonna in a very yeah. different way. I mean, we are working with it very different, but I think he had that feeling of 
let's not treat digital as something terrible. Let's treat it treat it as something that's really interesting and and uh, different. You know, um, and and I think um, that flavor is is very strong in the film, in the song. And I think the fact that we created the verses just by cutting up and repositioning the music of the chorus um, made it true to that aesthetic. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. I um, what it feels like for a girl. I always thought that was such a a bit of a departure from the heavy Mirrorways electronic sound that she was doing mm-hmm. on the music album. So I thought it was interesting that here's this sweet, you know, gorgeous, lush sounding song. Almost. Yeah. Different. Yeah. It was like, it had a very, very different vibe from the, some of the harder like music or impressive. It's, 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 it's always the story of my life is I always want to be thought of as the hard man of techno. And I'm always I'm the big softy <laughs> really on, I'm always going to be the ballad guy. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting that for the video release of What It Feels Like for a Girl, she then did choose that super hard remix. Yeah, of- yeah she because made it- a hard left. <laughs> yeah, she did. I mean, I think, because um, that, actually that's above and beyond, uh, which is really interesting because mm-hmm. um, I kind of knew those guys a bit um, uh, because Sudden Brain Freeze, can't remember his name now, um, uh, one of the members of Above and Beyond, Tony, Tony McGuinness, He'd had a day job at Warner Brothers uh, doing um, marketing. Mm-hmm. And I'd be going into Warner Brothers with various things I was doing, you know, like I can't remember uh, going to record company uh, offices. And I'd always bump into Tony. He'd always be the guy who'd want to talk to me about my synths. And that's not really what kind of record company people normally want to talk to you about. And say, like, oh, uh-huh. which synths do you like and which software and all that stuff. And then he suddenly told me one day, he said, you know what? I hate my job, and what I've been doing is I get a four hours sleep. I, 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 I do a day job at Warner Brothers. I race home to the studio, and then we work through the night. And, and then, you know, I stop at four in the morning, sleep for four hours, and then go into work. Um, and I just want to give it up. And then when the Madonna thing came in, he said, This is my chance. I pitched as a remix so that I can get above and beyond off the ground and we can, I can kill this horrible day job, which I don't mind. <laughs> so it was, it, I was so happy for Tony that he sort of was able to use it to launch his band and, and everything like that. Um, and, you know, if there's somebody I was going to trust to do a good mi- mix of that song, it was him, you know. Yeah, yeah and that, honestly, is, it's a killer remix of that mm. song. Like, I yeah. thought it was amazing how night and day, the, uh, you know, you have the original, and, but I felt like it kept the inherent nature of the song yeah. And just sort of like amped it up. It was like, yeah, I mean, it what to, it feels it like to, for a girl goes to the club. Yeah, it had to be aggressive because, you know, the nature of the video they did and everything like that. You couldn't, it, it would have been a bit too disorienting to do it with a sort of mellow vibe of my thing. But I thought Tony did it in a way that's very respectful to the song. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I, I feel like all the remixes for that single really worked. Um, mm. The one I, I love the, the reworking that she did for the, Drowned World Tour, and she changed yeah. the lyrics and you know translated them to Spanish. I mean, it was like yeah. the, the song was reborn yet again. Yeah, I remember because um, I remember I had to give my approval to the Spanish version when I heard it. I was just like, oh, it sounds even better in Spanish than in English. Probably, but, <laughs> but I don't speak Spanish, so I don't know. But it sounded, it just sounded so poetic. You know? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So you next worked with Madonna on her song Nothing Fails for her right. American Life album. How did you get back into the world of Madonna? Oh wait, let me um, let me oh, interrupt you for sure. one second. Okay. I you know, in the last year we've been talking to different people and the consensus is most people kind of see Nothing Fails as a a companion to like a prayer. So also speak right. on that. Um Ooh, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing with Nothing Fails was funny. I originally wrote the song with Jem. Uh, mm-hmm. who, do you remember that? It's Jem. I oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jem hasn't been around for a bit now, but Jem and me um, met up and we came into the studio and we'd just written that sort of, sort of 90% written, that, I'd have said. And then for whatever reason, it didn't fit on Jem's record. And then I think we. I think I can't remember who sent it to Madonna, but then she was like, "Oh yeah, she loved it," and then she was up for doing it, and uh, she did it with me always. And she tweaked the lyrics, but it's essentially the song she was given. But I'd say that Mirwais' production is obviously very different to, mm-hmm. to, to to my production. But that, I was fine with that because, in a way, um, when you just submit it as a song and then you just wait to be astonished by what the producer does, that's kind of better than me and Mirwais having to choose whose bass drums better or something you know that would that's, uh-huh. 
<laughs> that would have been a terrible way to make it. Did you envision it having such an epic scope originally? Like, because, you know, Madonna, had, there is that chorus mm. that comes yeah. in at the very end with the choir. And, and yeah, did you guys record mm. that with like a full orchestra? I didn't, I wasn't involved in the production of that. Oh, um, okay. I mean, my, de- my demo with Jem is just um, the sounds I had available and um, uh, Jem's singing guide vocal so it's mm. uh, i mean it's interesting it's definitely interesting um, yeah no and, but, and that's great but, that you can create yeah. something you know so internally and then see yeah. it develop this way yeah uh, but i mean uh, it's very much the the musical choices of the final record are very much Miways and, and madonna and i wouldn't want anybody to you know credit me with that i think they you know that's their mm-hmm. production Mm-hmm. Um, and in general, you know, uh, one thing I would say uh, that about my experience working with Madonna is, um, funny enough, it's something William Orbit said to me, and I thought, yeah, it's kind of true in a funny sort of way. So he said that when he was, well, I got to meet William Orbit after, you know, doing working with Madonna on, on that on that record, and he said, you know, in some ways, he said um, he felt on the Ray of Light album, it was really Madonna producing William Orbit more than it was <laughs> William Orbit producing Madonna. <laughs> And I kind of know what I mean. What he means by that, it's like her getting in and saying, "I know that stuff you do on your records. Well, now we're going to focus it and make it, you know, big and pop and everything." And and uh, I think that's kind of what she did with me as well. And um, I do remember a, a couple of things, you know, she said to me, which I often quote to other people during our, our working together. And she um, she said to me, "I'm very good at simple, mm. and simple is hard." And mm, I know what mm, she yeah. means. I know. I mean, I know m- many musicians will tell you that simple is, yeah. simple can be very difficult to do well. Yeah, I mean, we've we've spoken to a lot of um, people that have collaborated with Madonna in the studio, mm-hmm. and that that is what everyone agrees on is that she yeah. shows up with the vision already in her head, and yeah. she wants you to help her bring it to life. And absolutely, and, I think she's completely un- underrated as a sort of producer stroke person in charge of her recordings i think people sort of assume that you know she just gets the phone number of a producer and they kind of make the record for her and then mm-hmm. tell her what it is or something and it, it, that's so not how how it works you know she's been making hit records you know since holiday and yeah. she knows more about it than most producers she works with <laughs> know about it so you know you'd be stupid not to sort of take on board what she's got what she brings to it you know yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, after you work with Madonna, I was surprised to see your collaboration with Britney Spears in the song Every Time, which is now yeah. iconic. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's a fan favorite and it also has a lot of like, you know, personal uh connotations, but tell yeah. us what that experience was like because, you know, this was I think one of the first times that Britney actually collaborated with somebody on her own to to put music out because most of the yeah. time I think she was sent music, correct? Yeah, I think, I mean, actually, uh, it's funny again, it's this thing of I might want to be a certain kind of person, but then I know who I really am and I wind up being that instead. Mm-hmm. So I'd done, um, I'd, I'd worked with Robin Carson on some tracks that she was doing for uh, um, an album and we did, I think we did two tracks together. And then Robin, when she got back to Sweden, had played them to. Some people in the Max Martin camp, I think Max Martin himself, I've mm-hmm. never met Max Martin, but as the result was, um, you know, people in that camp, I, I think it was Max, but I don't want to get, get my facts wrong, saying, well, Guy should work with, with Britney, it would be fantastic. So Britney came around to my, my room in London, and again, there was this, initially this thing of me, maybe it's like the story, my story of Madonna and the, the two tracks and the second track, um, when you really always know it's going to be the one that it isn't. And me sort of thinking, God, I have to be able to compete with all this kind of big bouncy dance stuff and I don't know what to do. And then um, Brittany sort of had this song that she could play to me really basically at that stage. You'll literally like two fingers on the piano, like press the chord like that, uh-huh. press the chord like that. But she could play it and she could sing it. And, I, and then it was suddenly like, okay, I get this. She's emotionally moved by it and I just have to make something that she loves and I know what I'm doing and I'm suddenly not trying to compete with Hit Me Baby One More Time. I, I always loved records like that. I always used to say to people when I heard Hit Me Baby One More Time, I said, I don't want to be the 
person's record gets played in the in the radio playlist meeting after yes. that one because mm. I'm <laughs> you know because I'm gonna be I'm gonna be screwed because that one is just so huge and you know I'm, anything you play after that's gonna sound puny right um, so I'd always loved the sound of Britney's productions of the, of the Max Martin that kind of Dennis Pop Max Martin thing that was happening um, I could hear that. Um, you know, and some of my more cooler music fr- friends who are more, you know, probably like Ganoka and, and Goldie would be like, you don't really like that, do you? I go, no, mm-hmm. I do. It's amazing. You know, um, it's a bit like, you know, if you talk to musicians, they may not always admit it, but every really serious, clever musician actually seriously loves ABBA because when you listen to it, just because it's popular and you hear it at every yeah, sure. thing, once you start analyzing music, you go, this is made by really, really smart people who really yeah. know what they're doing, who are really musical. Yeah. You know, this is, this is fantastic music, isn't it? And I think I could hear that in those early Britney records. It was just like, I, I love them. And so I, I felt when I got into every time, I, I suddenly knew I can do what I think this needs and I don't have to worry about having to compete with the, the, the brasher stuff. I can be the big softie I know I really am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even though I want to be thought of as the hard man of electronic, you know. <laughs> no, and you can tell that fans appreciated being yeah. shown another side of her, you know, a more yeah. musical side. I mean, we, yeah. I, I was blown away by it. I remember listening to In the Zone the mm. day it came out, and when it came to every time, I was like, where did this come from? This is yeah. so lush <laughs> and so mm-hmm. unexpected, and, you know, there's yeah. there's there's no dance beat, and I love it. We're like, what's yeah. going on? Help me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, and there's no, there's no harmony vocals. There's no, you know, no dance routines. Yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, it's really funny, actually. Um, I had one idea for that that, that um, drove my engineer crazy, but I'm glad we stuck with it, which is I, I didn't want to do it to a strict tempo. Yeah, I, I wanted it to slightly slow down and speed up a bit at points, and it meant, because I was still using computers, that we had to kind of create a, a kind of floating click track. And with mm-hmm. the software then, that was quite tr- tough. It, it's kind of much easier to do that now. But I was like, mm, if this is absolutely, you know, grid on it's gonna kill the soul of it this one it can't be that um and you know it just it did mean that uh at the later stages getting it you know when you've colored in most of the arrangement and you try to mix it there was mm-hmm. there was more faff for the engineer than than would have been the case if everything you know even if you set a delay line it's going to go out of time when it slows down and there's all that mm-hmm. kind yeah. of technical faff but it was worth it because it it just meant the song breathed in the way mm-hmm. i wanted it to breathe you know? And Guy, I wanted to ask you about your next um, foray into the p- big pop world, you know, working with Maverick Recording Company and producing yeah. Alanis's Flavors of Entanglement, which is one yeah. of her standout albums as well. Yeah. I've followed her career and um, I-, I love this album and I love the first two albums. Uh, so mm. yeah, give us some quick impressions about working with Alanis because she's also, she, you know, she plays instruments and she, she has a clear vision, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... Actually, um, Alanis was one of those things where um, she kind of sent me a, a message. I can't remember if it was on MySpace. It was one of those things. <laughs> where, Throwback. It was one of those things where you're initially kind of, is this really Alanis Morissette or is yeah. it somebody, you know what I mean? <laughs> Cat, kind of you're stuff. getting catfished. <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever it was. And then you kind of try and check out, is this, is this real and everything? And yeah, it was. And she had already done a cover of Crazy, I think. So mm-hmm. she's yeah, obviously she a little bit aware of my stuff. And that was good. And and um, we met up in London and we started writing songs and it just immediately went really well. So mm. then we did more of it and it just grew and grew. And uh, I think that um, she is, one thing I think she's amazing, she, she, can, she writes songs so fast um, uh, when she's in the zone. And I've admired that because, you know, I, I'm one of those people if I can't get, you know, I do occasionally write lyrics, but if I can't get that, second line of the second verse right you know it'll take me months or something mm-hmm. to try and get something that i don't think sucks you know and she's just very quick with it at getting the feeling of it and i think i kind of figured out that um how the writing days tended to work better there was it was as if she obviously had in her mind something that she wanted to write about mm-hmm. and then i would try and prepare a few sketches that would just just be like musical fuel for that and then maybe each day i'd try and have like three ideas and then obviously she would immediately listen and go, all right, idea number two. And that would be the one that would be the right bed for whatever she wanted to write about. And we'd take, take off on that, you know. 
Um, yeah, and, and she's another one that her voice <clears throat> is an instrument, so you kind of have to play along with that too, right? Yeah. And in fact, as well, I'd say that with Alanis, um, her vocals, if you get her singing it like five minutes after she's written it, she's going to sing it better than any other time, <laughs> nah. which, is, which can be tough because you, you're often not in an ideal situation like that. Um, but, you know, there are some singers who, uh, they, they're just, uh, you know, it's, it's very businesslike and they can do it at any moment and all that stuff. But in my experience with Alanis, um, it was always like the earliest takes, even if there's a little technical flaw or mic pop or whatever, you could just work on that later to get it sonically good. But in terms of performance, uh, when, the, when the song was really fresh in the mind and the emotions that sort of drove it were fresh, uh, that was the best. And just occasions when we'd meet three months later and one word, one lyric had changed and the drop-in making it match was strangely difficult, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because we were both in a different place, you know. It's, um, again, it's fascinating how artists are very different like that. Um, I know other artists where you could, um, you know, you know the, the kind of consistency would be very different because they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're, just, they're in a very different mind space, I think. Um, so you created Fru Fru with yeah. Imogene Heap and Details. Yeah. Uh, the band's only album is a cult classic. Uh, I was just listening to, in advance of this, I was listening to Let Go yeah. again last night. And I don't think I've listened to it in years, but I knew every single word as I was <laughs> strutting down the street. Uh, I was like, yeah. oh my God, this is such a good song. Um, did you discover Imogene early on in her career? Um, you're, yeah. You're, you're both um, Francophiles and you, you, you know, you're, yeah. you brought your admiration of all things French to the project. So yeah, I think there was um, various things. I mean, I first heard Imi. Um, God, I think she might still have been at the Brit School. I think I was. Um, <laughs> I think Imi's manager Mark had somehow given me a cassette of her demos. You know, she was. You know, there's this school in England, the Brit School. Yeah, mm, uh, it's it's no. where Amy Winehouse, all these people went to it. Imi was there the first year it opened, and. Um, Mark Wood had given me a demo tape of her songs. I think I was in the Bjork band, like on a tour bus, mm-hmm. listening to this and going, God, I love this. Uh, mm-hmm. This girl's voice is amazing. And the way she does that kind of yodely thing is fantastic. I'm loving it and everything. And I did one song with her on her debut album that she did on her, on her own bat. Um, and just we really um, had this kind of meeting of minds where it, it's just really natural. The two of us, like, even, you know, the kind of melodies we like, the kind of intervals we like, the kind of sounds we like, which is very um, uh, very compatible, very, you know, it, it, it's, it's almost like our taste was very, very similar in, in music. And I think there was another... Your souls, your souls were connected in a previous life. <laughs> so something like that, yeah. yeah. And I think the one thing I thought with her a little bit was um, uh, on the demos, the big thing I said to her was that she was sort of singing a bit pseudo-American and I just said I think you should just be yourself yeah. uh, don't don't pretend you're you know um, you're anything than who you are sing the way you, you speak be that yeah. person when that you was sing. a good call yeah mm-hmm. and I just because just uh, and if you listen to those early demos there was a, you know it does happen a lot to UK artists maybe less so these days but that they kind of wind up in this kind of middle of the Atlantic Ocean thing that <laughs> isn't quite to do anything and, and I, I mean look we've all occasionally slipped into american pronunciation to make a rhyme work but it's kind of like <laughs> i can't and i know some singers can just put a mask on and be a completely different person when they sing mm-hmm. but I, I i just i genuinely think for most people just kind of be that same person when you sing that you are mm-hmm. when, when you it, you're like a heightened version but you are the same person I, I guess that's more my taste yeah. well the more true to yourself that you are the more yeah. you'll resonate with the people who are listening to you i sometimes think if you have a if you have a, something in you know uh, if you're pretending if you're pulling yeah. stunts yeah yeah, yeah. 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 i don't you think won't, I don't, you won't resonate I don't, I don't think musicians are actors i think um funnily enough when i was doing with alanis on um uh, Close and Entanglement. She's uh, she certainly back then. She was very good friends of Woody Harrelson, and he came to hear some of the demos. And we were chatting, and they're saying, and, I, and you know, it's this thing that actors are actually secretly jealous of musicians because musicians get to be themselves. 
Yeah, mm. they get to tell the truth. They tell the truth and be themselves. Actors have to read the words that somebody else has written for them. Mm. Right. You know, <laughs> and feel the emotions that somebody else has created for them. And, and I mean, I'm not, but, you know, I, I admire great acting. But I, I, think, I think being a musical artist is different from being an actor. I know that people think of Bowie or somebody as somebody who goes into a character. But even then, the more you know about him, you go, yeah, but it, it was him <laughs> with all those layers behind it, no doubt. But, you know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So I want to talk about your solo album, Stet. I, I was yeah. so happy to hear Imogen's voice all over this album. And yeah. I love that you guys still work together. Um, yeah, tell us, you know, what this album means to you. Um, and also tell us if, you know, you have anything going on with uh, Imogen in, in, in the future, because we'd love to hear sure. you guys collaborate some more. I mean, Yeah, I think we'd love to do more stuff as well. Yeah, I, I think... Um, oh, I would just wanted to say a little bit about Stet. I mean, it's... Mm. It's so beautiful. I mean, it's been described as post-classical, but I love mm. to put it on because it takes you on a journey. It's like, you know, it's like a very stripped down piano solo. And then it just goes into like this futuristic landscape and then mm. it goes ambient. And I don't know, it's just, it's all over the place, but it's the place I want to be at. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really interesting. Um, I, I kind of wanted to do my own thing. And, and, you know, it's funny for me that my roots are in, in classical in a funny sort of way. Yeah. So it's like a kind of homecoming, but it was also like, I didn't want it to be nostalgic as such. And just, um, it, it's funny because I spent my whole life like sort of hiding behind these huge personalities like, like Björk or, or Madonna or whatever. And, um, I still don't particularly like, um, being the center of attention. I, 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 I like, you know, it, it's, um, in fact, I even know that, um, the artists I've worked with, they know that there's a kind of, public face when you're on duty mm -hmm. where you have to be a certain person for the press or whatever but even they know that that, that's, that, that kind of circus is a bit ridiculous in a way you, if you, you can't um, take it too seriously you have to treat it as, as something almost comical um, yeah. or it'll, it'll devour you very quickly you know? mm -hmm. um, and I always thought Alanis had a very level headed view of it all that it, that it was uh, a kind of hilarious circus that, you, yeah. you know and uh, and anyway, so I wanted to make my own record and, you know, it started out with me just playing stuff. I'd sometimes have my laptop in an airport lounge or something and I'd just write some music like with, that's why a lot of them went up with being a piano because it's just like, let's pick just one color and just work with that because I haven't got mm -hmm. time to get a huge computer with 150 tracks of audio. Let's just sort of doodle away and see what I come up with. And then... I think various obsessions came through and was like, oh, I really like this. Um, and the funny thing was well, I was determined uh, to do a couple of things that were quite tricky. And that, that opening track, Sing, I just had this idea. It was really funny. I was, uh, I was in the synagogue in Ukraine, as, as you do. I was just as going one there. does. Yeah. As one does. <laughs> I don't know. It was one thing. My, my wife's family used to live there, and we went into this. I would, no, just me on my own. I went into it, and then I just sort of saw this picture of what the piece is going to sound like. It's like it's like very. I don't know any of the individual notes, but I know the idea of what it will be when it's done. Mm -hmm. And of course, I sort of started working it out, and then I was going, "Shit, this is." It says it's sing sing, but it's kind of unsingable. And then I thought, "Who can do the unsingable?" I thought, it has to be Immy. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> Immy has this crazy range and. Um, as well, she's persistent enough that if you are, if you ask her to do something that's impossible, then she'll stick with it and make it work. She'll do it, yeah. She'll do it, kind of thing. Um, so that that was another reason why I kind of knew it had to be her, and and it became a kind of test for me that that had to be track one because I thought, in a way, it's quite a difficult track. Although I don't think it's, I never do super hostile difficult. I don't I don't really do that. You know, that kind of alienating. I'm going to mm -hmm. I'm going to make this painful to listen to. I can't do it. I try to, but uh, again, I'm not this hard man. Of, <laughs> you know, um, I'm sure if I worked with Einstein and the Neubauten, I'd get him doing a lullaby. You know, it's just I don't know. It's something about me. But but I wanted it to be track one because I was always like, if you get past this one, then you you kind of pass the admission test, pass the velvet mm -hmm. rope, the rest of the record. No, it's, it's the perfect opening because it just like <laughs> yeah. everything just kind of opens up and it swells, yeah. and I, I love it. Yeah, and the idea was it was going to start on one note and then it was just going to flare out and, you know, that, that I thought, yeah, and you, the first time you hear would be the singer going and then they sing it and, and I, just, I just had to start like that. And then the funny thing was the last track um, was what had this strange journey where going right back to my first time going to Japan with Talvin Singh, 
Mm. We were both huge fans of this record that Ryuichi Sakamoto had made, where he had these singers from Okinawa, which is a you know the far south of Japan, and they don't even sing, speak Japanese. It's a slight different language. Yeah, it's and like their a tropical melodies, island in Japan. Yeah, tropical, and they have this very particular kind of melodic melodic thing that I just love. And I suddenly thought, I want to, I want to get into that flavor. And I was actually, I actually went to Okinawa to work with an Okinawan artist. And I hooked up with this sort of British guy who lives there as a kind of musicologist and everything like that. And um, Mika, she's called, and she was fantastic. And there was just this one funny thing that happened, which was on her old recordings, her voice was much higher. Oh. And when I got there, I'd already created this, sound, this accompaniment with this orchestra. I'd even recorded cellos and violins. And she, she, sung, she could sing it beautifully, but not in that key. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things where it's like, oh damn, the orchestra only works in that key. It's like you, you go below the bottom note of the cello and you just can't do it if it's lower. So I, I thought, damn, I'm going to have to make a version for her mm-hmm. that's got a different instrumentation, which I did do and I put it out. But then I thought, I've got to find somebody who can sing it in the key I wanted it. And I, again, I knew only Amy is going to be prepared to try and learn Uchi Noguchi, which is the Okinawan language. And she delivered. And, <laughs> and she sung it not only in the high key, but an octave below as well. And, uh, <laughs> so I knew that she could sort of make sense of this crazy thing I had. She wouldn't regard it as ridiculous. You know, and would have the patience to, to listen and learn the, the sound of the language. And, mm-hmm. you know, I ran it by Mika to see that it was good enough and everything. And, you know, so that was... You know, just fantastic that that her contributions kind of bookend the record. Yeah, it's amazing that you made that that discovery while you were recording because I always noticed, you know, especially when listening to like uh, Bollywood music or Eastern yeah. music from you know China or Japan, it's always mm. at a higher key and always, you know, the tempo is always faster. But that's that's just a cultural assignation, if you will. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's it's funny. Like um, tempos are one of those fascinating things because. Um, uh, again, some side of me always wants to be uh, faster, harder, and all that stuff. And then, mm-hmm. actually, I sometimes discover that when I slow things down, they get even more interesting. I remember this uh, song I did with Björk and Ravel, which I'm very, very proud of. And when I was creating that backing track for it, the big thing I had in my mind was, I want this to sound too slow. I want it to sound like it was written faster and I slowed it down. I want it to mm-hmm. sound like... Any slower and it'll collapse. You know? yeah. And it was always, as I was programming, I'd go, oh, can I go any slower? And then at what point will it just not work anymore? But it was like <laughs> I wanted to get as close to that kind of point as I dared. Because mm-hmm. um, it's, it's, I think, again, it's one of those funny things that you, where the public's perception and the musician's perception is quite difficult. It's different because um, a lot of people think that fast is really difficult. And of course, you know, playing shred van halen beat it solo is is very technically difficult but a lot of musicians will tell you that really slow music is is more difficult because everything matters yeah every mm-hmm. if you if you make one mistake it's like farting or you know it, 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 <laughs> everybody can tell you made a mistake in a slow tempo. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah in a slow tempo like error is really obvious and, and and failure to play a line beautifully or something like that is really obvious yeah. Um, well, guy, and, a, a, as you know, you know, a yeah. wise woman once said, "Simple yeah. is difficult." You know? Simple <laughs> is difficult, exactly. And she was right on that, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, so sometimes I find it quite interesting and challenging to see how far I can slow things down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Stefan, I think it's time for my favorite part of the podcast. Yes, yeah. I think we've gotten to that point, guy. We do a yeah. little section on the show called the lightning round. The lightning round is basically just meant to be off the top of your head, wherever you're at in your day. Yeah, uh, it's obviously yeah. Madonna focused. So, uh, right, okay. favorite favorite Madonna song, and it doesn't have to be a song you wrote for her. Or it could. No, be. no, I, I, I wouldn't uh, put my own. That would feel like too much ego. But I, I'd say "Lift to Tell." Mm, um, um, but I'd also I also have substitute for love, and if I want to dance, it's got to be "Get Into the Groove." Ah, oh, nice. Nice. Uh, favorite <laughs> Madonna music video. Rain, which has got Ryuichi Sakamoto in it. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> yeah, there uh, you go, you see. <laughs> uh, not sure if you've seen Madonna on tour, but uh, do you have a favorite Madonna tour? I saw her twice around the time of me working with her, and I'm afraid I can't remember the names of the tour. But the it one must where have been the Drowned World Yeah, tour. probably Drowned World Drowned Tour. World. If you... And then there was a second one I saw where Stuart Price was in the band, and I love... Confessions. Confessions. No, it was he, probably... He is... 
reinvention. Stuart was Stuart. the band. Um, and then uh, he was the musical director for Confession. Yeah, the one that Stuart... I mean, I loved the one before, but I thought Stuart's energy was fantastic. Yeah. You know, one I mean, minute he's playing bass, next minute DJing. Every, yeah. mm-hmm. I loved that tour. Uh, mm. Do you have a favorite Madonna movie? <laughs> um, I, I, would it be... Um, Ridiculous to actually talk about Desperately Seeking Susan, which is not at all. Not at all. That's the (laughs) iconic Madonna movie. Yeah, I know that's probably like the obvious one, but I kind of, I can't help it. I I think this whole 80s fantasy, I'm I'm totally, Mm -hmm. I'm totally with it, you know, of a kind of dream 80s that perhaps um, we're making up for the most part, but I love it. I can't help it. (laughs) And then do you have a a favorite Madonna look? And that can be from either a movie, a music video in real life, in person. (laughs) I, I think Mary Testina's uh, picture on Ray of Light is mm-hmm. super gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And it's that kind of thing where she seems to be captured in a very simple way. Again, it's not, it's not like heavily made up, but it's mm-hmm. just ravishingly beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that's obviously that kind of eye that great photographers have, but I don't quite know how they do it because it's simple. It's a bit like the um, Mondino did the cover of the ex debut and, it, mm-hmm. it kind of looks like it could have been taken by anybody, but there's some way that only a great photographer could have done it. Yeah, you know. And Does, I think I when, think I think the Testino Ray of Light cover has something similar to me. When you met Madonna, does she have that glow in person, right? The, the, the photographer doesn't need to do a whole lot of work, right? Madonna just sort of no, I know. I, comes around I with that mean, aura. I, I don't mean the photographer is some kind of plastic surgeon or something. I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> I'm just saying that there's a way that they they still bring some special viewpoint or magic to it and yeah i mean she yeah, looked fantastic when I, when I worked with her she didn't she looked fantastic even in the studio she looked you know uh great what i mean is i th- I, th- I think if something's super high concept and super made up then we can appreciate the artistry of what the mm-hmm. photographer did yeah and we sometimes fail to notice it when the picture looks more straightforward mm-hmm. i guess that's all yeah, well yeah no i i, I yeah. totally agree and um mm. Uh, we know you're a busy man. Is are there any other projects that you have you've got coming up that you can tell us about? Um, I've just um, finished a record with a good old friend of mine, Kate, who's from Norway, and uh, Kate Havdevik. And um, it was one of those ones where, because of lockdown, we wound up kind of doing a lot of it um, with like she's in Norway singing. I'm p- preparing the tracks in London, and then my ex engineer Chris, who's in Sweden, is mixing it <laughs> as a kind mm. of invigilator stroke referee, I guess. Um, and actually we're doing, um, a concert in Iceland on the 5th of November to play it for the first time, um, oh, which is fun because cool. I probably have to learn it and figure out, mm-hmm. uh, how the hell I'm going to play live the stuff I put on the record. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully Bjork is in town and she'll come support you. Yeah, your... she'll probably come. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've got a lot of connections with Iceland. I don't know if you guys have ever been there, but it's a, it's a very special country. Yeah, that's um, what I hear. I'm looking forward to going. I mean, I yeah, I, it's. I've been a big fan of Bjork since I was in high school. I went to see the Sugar Cubes in their first and only American tour, and ever I've been hooked ever since. So yeah. Oh, actually, that, that's um, an, funny yeah, enough, uh, Siggy from the Sugar Cubes is going to play drums yeah? for us on, on that show. Which oh, really see, fun. it all comes together, guys. <laughs> yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, that's our show for today, Guy Sigsworth. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have, I've had over 30 years of questions for you that you've answered, and I'm, I couldn't be happier. Um, oh, thank let you so everyone, much. Yeah, you're welcome. Let everyone know where they can find you on social media, and, um, and you guys, please I'm, I'm, go. I'm and rubbish at social his... media. <laughs> I'm not okay. like Emmy. I don't know how Emmy no, does that, it. I can't do it. I'm that's kind of, perfect. Well, I run away from social media, but I, I probably shouldn't. But <laughs> It's okay. You know, uh, follow Imogen Heap yeah, on so Instagram. <laughs> And no, seriously, you guys, anywhere that you can find music, <laughs> anywhere that you can find music streaming, check out uh, Stet, S-T-E-T. Um, it's Guy yeah, Sigsworth's it's solo it, yeah. album, and it's really good. Did I, yeah. did I tell you the, the reason for the na- name Stet? Can I just, no, I am quite actually, proud of I, I should have asked you that. Go ahead. Right, okay. Um, I came across this word, I can't remember where, but like there was, it, it's a phrase they use in proofreading. Oh, sure. Uh, and, it literally means let it stand. And it, it means it's a way of telling the proofreader that something that's unusual is not a mistake. Right. Mm. It means I know it looks odd, but it, I mean it, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I thought if I called it step, I was kind of like telling myself this is not a mistake. No, it certainly is not a mistake. There is <laughs> so not a I kind false... of thought it's a good name, right? Yeah. It's not yeah. a mistake. You know. <laughs> no, that, that's a perfect title. 
Uh, yeah, and uh, for everyone listening, obviously you can find us on Twitter and Instagram, MLVC Podcast. Give us a five star review, like and subscribe, share it with your friends. You can also donate to the podcast at Venmo, MLVC Podcast, as well. You can find us on Patreon, patreon.podbean.com slash MLVC Podcast. Guy Sixworth, thanks again. This was awesome. Yeah, I love, thank you so much. We love much. hearing thank some you. stories behind the music. It's, uh, it's always yeah. good to hear them. Thank you. And uh, bye then. Yep, so yeah. uh, we'll see you guys next time. See ya. Oh, that crazy Madonna. She's always saying unexpected things. It's heart bitches. Right when you think you got me figured out, you don't. All right, get ready to go to the fucking Caribbean and get a tan, yo. Can you imagine me on the beach getting a tan? Then you'd know there was something wrong with me.